Well, Deidre, thank you so much for being here with me on the Entrepreneurial Success Podcast. I mean, I'm so looking forward to this and I'm so looking forward to introducing you to everybody. So why don't I just hand over to you, tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Uh, so my name is Deidre Shen. I am the CEO and co-founder of Cap Show, which is the world's first AI-powered podcast copywriter. Uh, so we can definitely go into more of that and, and how I got there, because let me tell you that it was not a, a straight journey or a straight path to me getting to this point. Um, but yeah, it's going to be very entertaining when I tell you exactly how we got to this oh. point. Absolutely. And I'm so looking forward to this because this is something completely new. It's something that I think nobody's ever heard of. So mm. I think curiosity is already stirred amongst everybody. <laughs> but before we get into all of that good stuff, tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you get started as a business owner and how did that kind of evolve to where you are now? creating yes. an AI for podcast content. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, oh gosh. As I said, it was definitely not a straight path, a journey. Uh, sometimes I wish it was, but then a lot of times I think it, we learn so much in the journey, don't we? Um, so uh, by way of background, my, I actually came from the corporate world. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent, I am Aussie. So I grew up in Sydney in Australia. First migrants, my parents uh, came from Malaysia. So I kind of like grew up with that, um, the whole, you know, you've got to do well in school, you've got to get all the marks, you've got to get a good job. Like, you know, that was very much ingrained in me so by the time I had left I studied I had I have a law degree actually a law and a combined law and business degree so by the time I left university I was in my corporate job in an investment bank um, it's called Macquarie Bank it's the largest investment bank in Australia and you know that was the path that I was on um, and, <laughs> uh, and you can really tell by now that that did not happen uh, I learned very quickly on you know definitely my generation uh it the quarter life crisis was a real thing we were all i think by the time we we're like hitting that mid-20s point so many of us my friends and were all just going through this is this what where is this it like is this what we're doing you know and you know my friends were all we're all overachievers as you can probably tell and we went to a top selective school in the state all of these things so you know we we're kind of all in this boat of following that path I have a lot of friends who are doctors and lawyers and management consultants and you know uh, and for me I definitely was in that quarter life crisis I um, was really fortunate because in my corporate bank corporate job in the bank I was actually put on a pretty high profile project uh, all the way up to the CEO like there was visibility all the way up to the CEO but what that did was it actually opened my eyes to the who I probably would have had to become to climb the corporate ladder. And that was just something that I didn't really want to do. And around that same time, I had just moved out with my then um, boyfriend, now husband, and he was also similarly in a, in a, his own quarter life crisis. So he was actually studying medicine and miserable. He was hating it. Uh, so when we just moved out, uh, I thought that I was going to, uh, you know fall in love with doing the cooking and I, I am not at all a domestic goddess I wish I was but I'm not <laughs> and so he did a lot of the cooking um, and fell in love with baking especially because uh, I love my desserts and he loved making them so it was like it was literally a match made in heaven and through that experience we actually realized we, there was just one moment um, he was working on one of my all-time favorite desserts which is a chocolate fondant and a lava cake and he and we were just like you know what is this is this something that we can explore because we knew that we want to do something different but we just didn't know what and through his love of baking and my love of eating desserts we were like maybe we can just do this we can open a dessert bar we can create a place where that we would want to frequent um as customers so that's what we did we actually opened so our first ever business was a dessert bar in sydney it's called the chalk pot and um, we we had no idea what we were doing. Like, mind you, this is the con. I've already said a lot of context, which was like, you know, kind of overachiever, you know, study law degree, all of that. Did not have neat. Both of us did not have any kind of experience or background in hospitality. Like none. Not even like a corporate, a casual. So why do I say corporate? Like a casual job. Nothing. And so it was 
it, when I think back on it now, I'm like, it was insane what we did. Um, because anyone who is listening to this probably knows how hard it is sometimes to go through and actually start and then grow a business. And that's, you know, you think about that online and then, and then you multiply that tenfold for a brick and mortar because, you know, there's leases that you have to sign and there's debt that you're in before you even open because fitting out of place is actually way more expensive than I thought it was going to be. Like, but time and time again, we just kept going. And I'm like, I look back at that, that now and I'm like, how? How do we just keep going? It's insane. Anyway, so um, we opened this dessert bar and uh, we opened it in the, you know, the we made marketing mistake number one. We broke the, the biggest cardinal rule, which is uh, relying on the strategy of building it and they will come because we built it and they did not come. <laughs> they did not come. Uh, because we thought we had the best thing in the world, obviously, as we all do uh, when, we, when we start a business. But the one thing, you know, people have to find out about it. Um, and that was what we didn't quite realize. You can tell how naive we were. So we spent months and months and months just like getting further and further in the red um, with this business. But there was a moment when we realized that, you know, we were just, and we were doing all the things. We were, you know, everything that we thought of to try to get the word out there, we, we would do. Um, and it paid off because there was one moment when it felt like, it was we became an immediate overnight success like it felt that way obviously that's not how it works um and so as of the back of that we actually grew that brand to five locations in sydney uh we also opened a burger restaurant alongside that so we have we had two of those locations and then uh in the at the end of 2018 we found out that one of our store managers um of our biggest grossing you know store and he'd been with us for years we found out that he'd been stealing from us um and we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars oh my goodness <laughs> yeah so it was oh yeah i wish it was just like a couple thousand here and there or even hundreds but you know it was a lot of money and it's kind of like it took sort of a moment like that a, a, a betrayal i guess like that to kind of stop us and make us look at what it, the, this path that we were on. And it's like, is this still the path that we want to be on? And uh, I think we came to the realization that it wasn't anymore. Like when we first started it and we were growing it, obviously we loved it. It was our first child as such, our first you know, baby that we were nurturing, uh, but we were kind of ready for it to move out. <laughs> we were like, you know, <laughs> I don't think this is, you know, quite what, what we want to, what we want to be doing um, for sort of, you know, a good amount of time. And so at that time, I was actually also working, exploring this other business idea with another co-founder, someone who I had actually met in corporate. And we were working on this fashion technology idea. And so it was kind of like, okay, with that going, with this betrayal happening and us rethinking everything and with my, with me going, is this how I want to experience life? Like I've always, I've always wanted to live and work overseas. So I think all of that coming together, I just was like, you know what? We need, we, we need to move. Like we're, it just makes sense at the time. And so we moved to New York city uh, and we just, we were just like, you know, like just pack up our bags. Um, we just, obviously we spent a good six months systemizing the whole business and making sure that it was able to run with, without us. Now we didn't know when we left, uh, so that was mid 2019 when we made the move over, we didn't know that we wouldn't be able to go back to Australia for like two years, obviously with COVID hitting. Uh, so that was not in the plans, but you know what? It, uh, it's been amazing anyway. It's been such an amazing journey. So when, when we made the decision to move to New York City, I actually was speaking to my other co-founder, Bonner, and I was like, you know, we were like, yeah, we can make it work, et cetera. You know, we'll just do all these, like, I'll do Northern Hemisphere hours, we'll do Southern Hemisphere hours, it'll it'll work itself out. But in the end, I was just like, oh, do you just want to move over with us? Like, why not? And uh, and she did. She decided to come over. So, uh, yeah, so that, so that worked out really well. So when we uh, moved over, in, when we landed to New York, we pretty much hit the ground running, just testing this fashion technology idea. Um, we, you know, went to NYU campus, to Columbia, because we, our hypothesis was that our customers were going to be um, either, you know, like college students or young professionals. So we went to Wall Street as well. We just started talking to women just to see if this problem that we were 
trying to solve for or something that you know would is a big enough problem and what we found after a, a few months probably about three to four months um of of doing this and also speaking to boutiques and brands on the other side of the platform we realized that while it was a problem it just wasn't a big enough one that people would be willing to change their habits for so we actually failed the business uh at the end of 2019 and so here we are in new york city we're like what are we going to do <laughs> We had, uh, we'd actually spent all of our savings prepaying 12 months worth of rent. So we kind of had it on our minds, we had 12 months uh, that we were going to make something work. And we just were like, you know what, we've been talking to all these boutiques and brands as well. And the one problem that they've been wanting help with over and over again, that they've been saying is acquisition. I think a lot of us, again, entrepreneurs can, <laughs> can vibe with this. So we were like, I think we can help in some way there. So we did the traditional thing. We just kind of started offering a sort of agency type service to help them acquire customers. And that kind of took off at the time. And then, but again, it was like, is this what we want to be doing? Do we really want to be an agency? And we didn't, we wanted, we wanted to actually really work, um, help those on the ground that were just starting their businesses. So we actually transitioned into coaching for e-commerce businesses. And uh, through that experience, because a lot of what we teach is storytelling on, you know, and, and especially for e-commerce, because it's so easy to hide behind your product. Um, and that was what we we're seeing a lot of our clients doing. And so I'd be like, you need to start, you need to put yourself out there. You need to actually have people, this is, you are your only differentiator, really, when you think about it, right? A product is a pro like, it's a commodity, but you and what you do and what you stand for and your values, like that is what makes you and your brand different. And so they were like, time and time again, they were like, okay, I get it, Deidre, I get it, but how, how do I tell my story? And so I started thinking through how to formularize almost what I do around storytelling, especially short form storytelling, like we're talking social media captions and things like that. Um, and that actually um, birthed, I guess, the first iteration of Capture of the software. So we launched that end of last year. So that was end of 2021. And uh, we, it was basically, it was quite rudimentary. Uh, it was, you know, you would kind of, follow these prompts uh, that would be asking you for your story and it would take those and then convert them into a whole bank of captions and emails. So that was the first iteration. And again, we made um, the second, uh, we, 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 you know, at the very beginning when, when we started business, we kind of made a, we broke, I guess, a marketing cardinal rule and we did, we broke another one again when we launched Capture because we were like, we can help all entrepreneurs. And so <laughs> we broke the rule of not starting with a niche. You know, we were like, we're going to market, this is going to change the world. And what we found was that, um, yeah, it's just not effective to try to market to everyone because you, you try to market to everyone and you market to no one. Uh, so we had to do a lot of, self, like we worked with a coach and he was very, lovingly direct with us to be like you've got a niche down you've got a niche so we spent a lot of time thinking through who was it that we wanted to work with at least to begin with um and it kind of it feels like a no-brainer now but at the time it was so painful that essentially the people that we want to work with was who we were right like that's where we always end up landing right? it makes the most sense um uh, and so we really wanted to so where we landed was helping experts who podcast um to grow their audience uh and so that's that's kind of the like the niche that we that we landed on and the way that we're now doing that that's why i'm really excited about this next iteration of capture because what that's led us to is this AI powered podcast copywriter where you just upload an audio file and literally everything. So we're talking episode title, description, show notes, social media posts and promotional email and the, and the full transcript is done for you. It's generated for you. The, the first draft of all of those done. So that's where we are now. And uh, we're gonna talk about more about this, but we are launching our beta program June 1st uh, which is going to be so exciting. You know, what is so fascinating about your story is, is exactly like you said, it is a long journey. And I think this is with everything 
whatever business you're starting in, there will always be a journey to go through. And you learn so much on that. You mm -hmm. make mistakes. And, and I don't talk about mistakes. I talk about lessons. But it is so important to, to go through those and to make those mistakes so you can learn what not to do next time yes. and to keep going forward. I think the determination at the end of the day is, is the most important thing to keep you driving forward. And that's what I see what you guys did. And it's so beautiful to hear this kind of journey that you've been on. But evidently, let's, let's be realistic. If you didn't start Chockpot, <laughs> yes. you wouldn't be here where you are now. 100%. And that's why, you know, I, I get asked sometimes the question of, you know, what would you have told your past self or were there any regrets? And I'm like, there were things that obviously sometimes I wish I had been smarter about, but then at the same time, I'm like, but everything happens. I truly, truly believe that everything happens for a reason. Like any decision that I made in the past, any mistake I made to your point, like it happened for a reason. Um, and I firmly, firmly believe that I am so excited about the the future of capture and and this business um i can this is almost the first time that i can actually visualize what it could become like and envisage a future i mean i i, I feel like anything that i envisage is probably not gonna is like you know but it's the first time that it feels something feels so tangible whereas and i think now like if i think back to my past self and if i was gifted this at some point then like i just don't think that i would have been able to yeah handle it you know um so i think i needed to go through that journey in order to get to this point yeah um, so yeah it's it's that growth and you know once you kind of grow in one entity you can take that that personal growth really you mm. can take that and then use it in your business but you can't just go and run a business and think it's going to be perfect from the start mm. and and i always say this and forgive me for everybody listening but i have said this before <laughs> the thing is nobody teaches us this but when you sign up for a business you actually sign up for a lot of self-development mm -hmm. and you have to go on that journey you've got to be open-minded to the fact that you are going to learn a lot and see it as lessons make mistakes mistakes are okay but only do them once yes. <laughs> that's the important part <laughs> learn yes. from them but no i'm really interested in cap show and i'm i think you know it's it's something that's like we said nobody's ever thought of it Nobody's ever heard of it before. And for me as a podcaster, it's really intriguing because let's face it, if I have to sit there and write all the show notes and do all the repurposing, it takes some yeah. time. And I'm used to it now, okay? Because I've been doing it for many years. But oh my gosh, if there's something out there like Cap Show can help, yeah, I'm intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's dive into this a little bit because we were talking about business you were talking about how you grow uh, or how you grew over the years but i think there's kind of like a misconception as well as to people who are starting businesses thinking that they can solely rely on social media mm. and from your kind of experience and and with what you have done and all the lessons you've learned yes. what is your take on that yeah wow uh, i i feel like i've uh i I know the spectrum in a way, and I'll talk specifically about Instagram because um, this is one of the, it was actually one of the main vehicles for growth for the chalk pot for our first business. Now, so I, I kind of have this love-hate relationship with social media because I love it because of that period of my life uh, of business, really. Uh, and there's a reason for that. The reason being is that when we were growing, so that this was back in 2000 and. 13 when we first started our business at that time instagram was also just kind of starting was just getting traction so we were fortunate because timing all those things meant that we could leverage the growth of that platform uh, now if you try to rely on something like instagram to grow your business like it's almost impossible like to completely organically you know like at that time we could just post a really ugly photo and like nothing in our caption and we would get all this like like we, we, we had videos and stuff that were going viral we had um you know jonathan uh, gosh uh, kim kardashian's bff jonathan someone um you know po repost one of our desserts like it was insane uh and you know but you look at now and it's like it's just not it just doesn't work like that anymore it's so saturated like you know people are like and so the saturation means that the algorithms you know we talk about the algorithms all the time have to change uh people are a lot more skeptical of the type of content that's out there so it's just a totally different playing field so that's kind of i just want to give you context because like 
I actually am a big fan of social because it totally helped, you know, my, my first businesses, but now totally different. And I think this is the th because I've gone through that transition, I can see that a lot of people try to, they're like, oh, well, I'm using Instagram. Why isn't it working for me? Or I'm using TikTok. Why isn't it working for me? And it's because, you know, the whole like post it and we'll get like thousands and thousands of views just doesn't really work. I mean, maybe on TikTok, but I'm, because I've been testing a lot and questionable about whether of how many of those people are actually your right audience, right? So put aside the vanity metrics of the number of views and all those things. It's really thinking about social media, how to, how to be smarter about how you use social media and why and what to actually use it for. So there's kind of a few things that I, um, I definitely am a big believer in for social media now. One is that we can't use it passively. Uh, this is like the number one mistake that I think we all make, me, myself included, right? Where we're like, oh, we'll just, we'll put up a photo and, you know, passively, because it's kind of like, I mean, I know it takes a bit of effort, but really you're just putting something out there waiting for someone to stumble across it or waiting for the platform to show your photo to all these people, like right? we're passive. Yeah. So yeah. I think, so that's the first thing is like, stop, let's stop being passive. We have to be active with how we actually use social media. And that actually means like participating in it, uh, which I, as an introvert, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the first to say I do not enjoy participation in almost any form, um, let alone social media, but it's kind of the, a reality of the world, of the world that we live in, right? So rather than thinking about the, the platform to just promote, 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 which is what we're doing when we're just passively trying to like shout, put things up there and shout about stuff, how do we actually find our people, our audience, and how do we participate in conversations that they are having? Um, how do we actually have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with them? How do we, you know, how do we just make ourselves visible so that we can actually use the platform in the right way. Now, the reason why we want to be visible, make ourselves visible, this is the other misconception is that like, oh, I just, you know, I posted this thing. Why aren't people buying? So like people don't buy from social media. I mean, yeah, if it's like a cheap-ish product or a small thing, of course, yeah, you, you get sales. But if we're talking about, you know, for me, experts um, who podcast, you know, if coaches, consult, like all those um, who I think are in your um, your audience, that's just not really going to happen. Like it's not going to come off the back of posting. Uh, so I actually came across this. Um, I was reading this book called Oversubscribed by Daniel Priestley. And he talks about this seven hour rule that people before they can make a buying decision, especially a big one, they have to spend at least seven hours with you. And that can't happen on social media in and of itself, right? Like that's just not possible. Because even when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, it's so true. Because I used to run a lot of challenges, like five-day challenges that end up being like seven, nine days. And it's such an effective vehicle to take someone from cold to closed because they have spent all that time with you. Yeah. And so that's why I was like, this makes total sense. But instead of relying only on social media, we have to actually we have to actually integrate long form content, which is why I fell in love with podcasting um, because it's such a fun way to, you know, to share our journey with our audience. So the reason why we want to increase our visibility on social media isn't to necessarily make sales. Um, it's actually to get people into our world, listening to our podcast or reading our blog or watching our YouTube videos, whatever that other, so that we can actually get them to bank up that seven hours with us so that, whatever that conversion event is off the back of it, a sales call or a challenge or webinar, whatever it is, it becomes a no brainer. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the other misconception about social media, about what expectations of it, I think are always so high. And so when it doesn't happen, we feel really let down. But I think if we can be really intentional with how we're using why we're using it and have a strategy, it just alleviates all of that. And then we can start to use social media for what it is that it's intended for. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. It feels like you're talking my language because I, <laughs> I say the exact same things to my clients is don't rely on social media to get clients. If you do get clients through social media, bonus, amazing, awesome, but rely on it for visibility exactly for the same reason that you're saying, you know, that seven hour rule is important because it's all about the relationships and it's not about selling in the first instance. And, and, and I think this is a hard concept for a lot of people to kind of swallow in the beginning going, 
But if I don't go out there and I don't sell, nobody's going to buy from me. I'm not going to grow my business. That should be like the rafter effect. The first yeah. thing that you should concentrate on is visibility, growing relationships. And I think you beautifully encompass that in, 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 in how you shared it because, yeah, it is, it is actually that simple. That's it. Yes. You yeah. know, if, if you're a business owner and you want to sign up more clients or sell more of your products, it's about visibility and building relationships. And don't rely on social media to sell. Rely on social media, you know, change the perception of it in, in order to grow your visibility. Yes, 100%. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there's, there's something else that you mentioned here, which is the content honey traps. Mm. And, you know, this is something that intrigues me as well, because when we are business owners, we talk a lot about content creation, especially online, which is really important. And this yeah. is one of the things that I share with my clients. And I talk about the attraction strategy, whether it's through a blog, whether it's, uh, you know, content through podcasts or videos or even on social media. But there's got to be a, a strategy as to what kind of content you create, how you put it out there and how you really build again relationships with people. So yes. I'm very intrigued to hear about your content honey trap because it does sound quite intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I, I believe that there's kind of two broad types of content that you want to be putting out there on social media um, and they are used for different def, for different purposes so one is like I call them content trust accelerators which is all about you know I mentioned before about storytelling and you know it's all about you and being real and raw and sharing your journey now that is great content to create a connection and increase engagement right so that's just one because I'm very data driven as well so I'm like okay if we're looking at what what we're actually trying to drive people to do you know if we look at engagement, that's a really great way to increase the engagement, right? So that's one part of it. And then we have the content hunting traps, which I would say is more on the promotional side. You're probably not going to get a lot of engagement, but that's okay because that's not the purpose of that type of content. Um, content honey traps, the purpose of it is really to compel someone to be so curious about what it is that you're talking about that they need to take that next step. Um, and so for me, that next step is generally listen to a podcast episode uh, because, again, I want to bank up that seven. Like I'm in it for the long haul, right? I'm, I'm playing the long game. Uh, so I want people to be spending that seven hours with me. Uh, so look, we're not going to get a lot of engagement on that kind of post, but we are going to get click-throughs. Um, and so that's what I'm constantly monitoring. So real in short, content, content, what content hunting traps are, and this is not just social media, but it's in actually every part of what I call that front-end funnel. So we lay our content hunting traps on social media. Um, we are really intentional with making sure that we increase our visibility to our posts and to our profiles so that people actually see the content hunting trap. They see the content hunting trap and then they land on our podcast. Even during the podcast, I am trying to be really intentional with laying content hunting traps to where I want them to go next. Um, so it might be at the beginning of the podcast, I want them to listen to the whole thing. So I'll put, I'll, I'll lay some there. Um, during the podcast, I want them to go to my show notes because that's where, you know, maybe my lead magnet is or, you know, just for them to keep going with me. So I'll want to lay content hunting traps there, you know, even when I'm emailing. So all through my front end funnel, I am really, really hyper aware of this. So Content Honey Traps is really a system designed to compel your dreamiest buyers to follow you through your front-end funnel. What does that mean? I have, I've actually created eight mental models around what a Content Honey Trap is. Um, four of them are based on stories, actually, and four of them are based on tips or value, I guess. So, uh, you know, and I'll give you some, I won't go into all eight because that's too much, but uh, I'll, I can give you some examples. So if we're talking about like the tips or the values that we, that we shared, that we want to share, um, the key here is to not give the answer away, right? Uh, so uh, there's one that I love using. It's called the rebel. Uh, and it's really about talking about what the topic is not about, right? So if we talk about, I don't know, an example is um, social media. Okay, what is so, social? So in my, I might say something like social media is not about posting and ghosting. It is not about, gosh, I'm trying to like make stuff up on the fly here. Um, it's not about... <laughs> Uh, just creating content blindly, it, uh, repurposing content blindly. Um, it is not about something else. And then, you know, but what is it about? Uh, click here to find out more. You know, so like that's just a really, really rudimentary example of like how that mental model can work because people are like, 
oh my gosh, okay, I, I know what it's not about, but what is it? Like all, all these things that you're saying, I always thought that that was what social media was about. So what is it actually about? And so they can't help but want to be like, I need to know the answer because you've opened a loop up in their minds and they need to close it. Um, so that's one type of, and then there's another, like obviously well-loved, well-known, we call it the cliffhanger, um, but it's like, how do you share a, a part of the story? Maybe it's a, fail, a particular failure that happened in the journey or something, but people are like, I need to know what happens next. <laughs> like one of the most effective, effective um, content hunting traps that you can lay. So I have eight of those mental models. Those are two that I spoke through. Um, but yeah, essentially it's like, how do you just create so much curiosity in someone that they need to do the next thing? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love the content honey traps. And as you were saying, I was going through my mind going, I got this and oh yeah, I've got this. And oh, I can create this idea. And as you were talking yes. it through, I had some great ideas for myself, but it is very true because I've experienced myself and I just never used the phrase content honey traps. But yes. if I look at my system and my strategy, I can also see in particular using my podcast, which is what we're doing here is I am using that in order to kind of captivate people's attention, create that curiosity, and then lead them on to maybe go and download a freebie or maybe go and sign up to my free workshop. And it's all part of the strategy at the end of the day, but it's very true of what you're saying. It's about how do you create that curiosity to hook them in mm. order to take the next step. And I do find that this is not, a, this is not something that we're born with as business owners but this is a skill you can learn. Yes. And I love the fact that you're talking about the eight, you know, content honey traps in particular and, and, and how you can use that. And I think for so many people that will go, Oh my gosh, I want to know what's the other eight. <laughs> there you go. She just left another content honey trap there for you. <laughs> See, she knows what she's doing, but at the same time, I think it's really easy for, for, for us to look at it and go, yeah, this is what we're doing for somebody who's listening to this going, okay, but I didn't know how to do that. Well, it is something you can learn. Like anything as a business owner, we learn all of these things through trial and error, journeys, short or long, it doesn't matter. Okay. But, you know, I think when it comes to content creation, there's so much creativity behind it of what you can do. What I would say is that it's not about doing everything. It's about finding what is aligned with you, but working with the right strategy in order to captivate them, create that curiosity, and then lead them on to the next step. And I love how you put it together with the content honey traps. It just makes so much sense. And I think everybody here now is thinking, okay, I got two of those eight. I still want to know what the other six are. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about content creation then, because there's a lot of time and energy spent for us as business owners in creating content. And like I said, for me, it's part of what I talk about, the, the attraction strategy. So do you feel from your experience and, and with the AI that you've now created that this is something that we as business owners need to focus on? Oh, um, okay. So yes and no. <laughs> okay. So what I mean by that is we do need to create content, obviously, because that's the only way that we're going to become, get known, uh, become visible, create credibility, authority, all of that, right? It all comes down to content. Should we be the one doing it all? Maybe not. Uh, so obviously as experts, yes, a lot of that's going to come from us and it's going to come from our strategies and, you know, how we talk about things and our values and our own stories. Uh, but if we're talking about, and, and I kind of almost like, di like differentiate the types of content. So, you know, for me and for a lot of people who podcast or who YouTube or whatever, you know, they, they always start, it makes total sense to start with your long form content, right? That's kind of almost the, the, the best way that you can always get out of your own brain <laughs> the things that you want to talk about. Um, now, when we then talk about sort of short form social media, it's very easy for us to just go, okay, I just need to repurpose, right? That's what we get told. I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that you you teach. Yes. Is it all about repurposing? <laughs> so my take on it is that we do want to be smart with the content that we, you know, how do we use our long form content to actually, and to leverage. So I should say, how do we leverage our long form content in our short form content? But a lot of times repurposing might not be the answer. So I call it re reconcepting uh, more so because we want to make sure that we are using each plat like we are creating content that is purpose fit for each platform. Uh, I fell down this because I was doing the same thing where I was just like trying to churn out content because I was like, yeah, I just I get told I need to create content, so I'm just going to create content for content's sake. 
but it wasn't doing anything for me, right? It was either way, like it wasn't getting engagement, it wasn't getting click throughs, it was getting nothing. Uh, so when I sort of stepped back and I was like, why am I even putting this time in? It just didn't make sense to me. Um, and so I went back to, okay, well, I have to be really intentional about A, which platforms I want to be on and then B, how I actually use that platform. And then that's what led me to actually being like, okay, I don't want to be the one doing it because <laughs> it's a lot of work and I don't want to be spending all my time creating content. Um, yes, I should be spending time with the initial, like the almost the strategy of the content, but I don't want to actually be the ones creating my reels and creating, you know, so I actually worked with um, my a, a VA um, and we actually came up with a full system where now I only ever spend two hours a week on social media activities and she does everything else. And we're talking about like reconcepted. So not just like audio clips of a podcast or anything like that. Like we're talking about purpose fit, different types of content for an Instagram, for TikTok, for, you know, um, all the different platforms. Uh, and it's taking the theme, it's taking the, you know, the, the podcast, you know, the, as a genesis, but it's actually using it in really cool different ways instead. Um, and so it could be, we're even talking about like, it could be a reel that is linked to the topic, but not actually just a clipping of the podcast episode, right? That's kind of, to me, that's what reconcepting is. I'm taking the thing and I'm just you know, I'm just reconcepting it rather than repurposing it, if that makes sense. So that's yeah. kind of the difference in terms of how I think about it. So yeah, so short answer is yes, content is really important. It is something and it has to come from you. Like it can't come from anyone else. Like it's your stories, it's your framework, it's your strategy. Uh, but who should be doing it? A hundred percent, you should be looking to delegate and outsource, um, outsource it for sure. Yeah. No, I agree with you 100% because I think that Creating content is one of those things that is a block for so many people, business owners in particular. It's like, I've got to create content. I've got to get it out there. Just like you said, we all go through it. I've been there as well. It's like, I'm just going to create it for the sake of doing it and getting it out there. But I think once you take that step back and you really have a strategy behind it saying, okay, I only need to do two hours a week of content, but then the rest I can hand over and delegate to somebody else it would make a huge difference because now that pressure is off your shoulder, but equally, let's face it, you've got to get somebody else who can really, you can trust with. Um, but once you start delegating that, you really can start seeing that you can do more mm -hmm. and not just more in your business, but you can actually create more content that you can totally. then delegate to other people. Yeah. And yeah, I do agree. I mean, an example for me, I don't ask me to sit and write blogs. Oh my gosh, I can't. Yes. Not one of my strengths. And I quickly yeah. realized that in the beginning of my business. But that's how I created the podcast because I love having conversations. I love this interaction, mm -hmm. this engagement. Yeah. And this is my content. So this is how I get my content out to my audience. Yes. But again, huh, sitting down, just writing the show notes, just writing, you know, the short um, uh, expert, ex exits. I can't even say it. <laughs> Here we go. Um, yeah. And, and even just repurposing that into social media content is, is a lot of work. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it makes a lot of sense. And, and I'm glad you're mentioning it, but I know so many people are listening to this going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I need to do that. I know I need to do that, but they still don't do it. They still yeah. try and do everything themselves. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's a hard thing to give up, um, you know, and totally like I was the same. I think a lot of us are uh, where content is because it's kind of like okay we either fall in one two camps either we're super super protective of it because it's like it's our brand and it's our voice and you know there's no one else can emulate that i have to do it or we sit on the other end of the spectrum where it's like i have no idea what this is about i'm just gonna like give it to an agency or something and you know like they can do with it what they want and none of those serve us well <laughs> you know just like with any, any extremes don't serve us well um so yeah coming up with a system um and this is also what we we do um help clients with apart from the software uh what we do help clients with is how do we install this system with a va so someone in their team to actually help with the content creation part of it the actual concept reconcepting bit um because that's a lot of effort that goes yeah. into 
into that um, and all the editing and, and everything, um, including the visibility growth hacking. So actually participating in those conversations and stuff. So that's, so my, you know, my, my VA does all of that. Um, my two hours is literally just like doing a 30 minute planning session with her, doing a 30 minute review session with her and recording that podcast and then shooting some re like quick reels here and there like that's literally it and she does everything else um so yeah if you know if you, that's basically in my mind the best balance um not necessarily going to an agency who like probably like can do a good job but i don't know if they'll quite get you the results that they that you know you might be looking for um but also doing it yourself is just like it's not going it's not scalable we all know that so yeah this is the best the best way i found i'm sure as you just mentioned that kind of time scale of how you work with your va some people are just thinking well that is just sounding like a dream come true <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, um, Deirdre, this has absolutely been just so phenomenal to talk to you, to listen and, you know, to, to hear what you have to say, which, which I find so intriguing and, and you know, the, the journey you've been on, but also how it's brought you to this amazing concept that you have now. But before yes. we conclude with everything, you've got an amazing beta program starting yes. in June, which you mentioned earlier on as well. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So uh, for any experts who podcast, we are launching the newest iteration of Capture of our software, which, as I mentioned, is the AI powered podcast copywriter. Um, so just to quickly recap, you upload an audio file and off the back of that, it will um, generate episode title, description, show notes, uh, social media posts and a promotional email, all of them based on the content honey trap strategy. Um, so it's kind of like inbuilt into the, the, the brains of the engine, which is really, oh really my cool. goodness. <laughs> it, honestly, that sounds too good to be true. So <laughs> what we're going to do for those of you here listening, and for those of you in particular who are running podcasts and think, Hey, this is something that I would like to do because creating that content, repurposing, is just one of those niggly bets that you just find is absolutely taking so much time and energy, then I highly recommend that you go down to the show notes. The details will be there for you to go and sign up. And then if you have any questions, if you uh, want to chat with Deirdre, or if you just want to go and check out a little bit more on her, her details for Instagram will also be down in the show notes and then also her own podcast. So you can go and check out to see how she's doing things. So please, by all means, go and follow her and Deirdre DM her, chat with her if you need to. But yeah, just go and have a look at this beta program. I mean, I'm going to have a look as well. I'm so intrigued. But just go and try some things out. You never, never know. I mean, talking about content creation and the importance of it, number one, but also making it easy for yourself and more fun and enjoyable. I think that's the other part that we're kind of lacking at the moment. Yes. Deidre, thank you so, so much again for being here. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much from beautiful, sunny New York, where you are. Cause <laughs> I, I think everybody's just staring at your window. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time being here. It was so lovely to meet you and we'll be in touch soon again. Thank you so much for having me on.